this morning, and uh, it's good. I'm glad to be with you this morning. I knew Pastor Peter probably would be back today, and uh, I'm glad you're just sitting back and enjoying and relaxing. And, and uh, from what he told me uh, a few moments ago, he had a tremendous time in the Dominican Republic, and I'm sure he will be sharing lots of that in the weeks to come. Uh, I was noting when I came in, looking at your bulletin, and uh, just in talks with, with Jackie this past week about how, how much of a, a praying <coughs> congregation you are. You know how, how good that is to hear? That the body of Christ in this place is a group of people who believe in the power and the, the efficiency, the efficacy of prayer. And uh, I saw that this morning too. And, and strangely enough, God was speaking to me and saying, I want you to speak about prayer this morning. Mm -hmm. Now, we can't hear too much about prayer, nor can we do too much praying. Prayer is such an important thing in our lives. And I'd like you to open your Bibles, please, to James chapter 5. James 5, and I want to read verses 13 to 16 with you this morning. This is sort of a jumping off place. I will be making reference to it in the message as well, but uh, this is where we will start this morning. <clears throat> Beginning at verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Did you get that last line? The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And I think many, if not all, here this morning will believe that with all of their heart. Before I start, let's begin in prayer this morning. Father God, thank you so much for this avenue that you have given us to come together and to bow our heads and hearts, our knees, our lives before you in prayer this morning. Thank you for this portion of scripture that we have just read, which speaks of the power and the effectiveness of prayer. And Father, we truly believe that with all of our hearts this morning. And I pray that as we consider the topic of praying for one another and just how important it is for the body of Christ to take heart of this very important statement, Father, that you will speak through the many scriptures I will share today. And that you, Father God, will be glorified in it all. That Jesus and Jesus only will be seen this morning. For I pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, before I start this morning, I just want to say that we're going to be looking at a lot of scripture verses this morning. And uh, you might want to turn to them as I make reference to them. I want to jot them down because we'll move along quite quickly with some of these. There's so many things in the Bible that speaks about prayer and the importance of prayer. And, you know, maybe look at these later in this week as you remind yourself of just how important prayer is to you and to the body of Christ. The Bible has so much to say about praying for one another, our responsibility in praying for one another. It's so important. A story is told about three men who were hiking one day and they unexpectedly came upon a very large, raging, violent river. And they needed to get across to the other side, but they had no idea of how they were going to do so. The first man prayed to God. He said, please, God, give me the strength to cross this river. And poof, God gave him big arms and strong legs, and he was able to swim across the river in about two hours, almost drowning a couple of times. <coughs> Seeing this, the second man prayed to God, saying, please, God, give me the strength and the tools to cross this river. Poof! God gave him a rowboat. He was able to row across the river in about an hour after almost capsizing the boat a couple of times. Well, the third man had been watching all this. He had seen how it worked out for the other two, so he 
He also prayed to God. He said, God, please give me the strength and the tools and the intelligence to cross this river. And poof, God turned him into a woman. <laughs> she stopped someone and asked for directions and was told just a couple of hundred yards off the stream, there was a bridge. <laughs> Sometimes we have to be careful what we pray for. A co-worker asked a friend why he got donuts if he was trying to diet. And he said, well, I, I, I came around the corner where the donut shop is, and I said to God, if, if he wanted me to buy a donut, to have a parking place right in front. <laughs> On the eighth time around, he said, there it was. <laughs> we can chuckle, but you know what? Prayer is a mystery to us. We're always trying to figure it out. Even if we've been pray uh, faithful prayer warriors all of our lives, we, we are constantly trying to figure it out. I'm guessing that all of us here this morning believes in the power of prayer, but we would have to admit, I think, if we were honest again, that we don't always feel like we're very good at it. Do you ever feel that way? You think to yourself, I'm not a great prayer. I can't pray like so-and-so. Maybe you don't do it enough, or maybe you think you don't do it enough. Maybe we don't do it enough. <laughs> One survey revealed that the average church member, and this, this, uh, these statistics kind of uh, concern me greatly, that the average church member spends four minutes a day in prayer, while the average minister spends about seven minutes a day in prayer. Wow. Why is that? Why do you suppose it's that way? Reverend Richard Meyer, in one of his books entitled One Anothering, actually he's got three volumes of this book. You know how many one anotherings are in Scripture? A lot. A lot. That's right. In this book, One Another, he gave three reasons for our lack of prayer in, this, in his chapter on praying for one another. He said, first of all, he said that we don't pray because we don't know how to pray. Well, the disciples didn't know how to pray either. Jesus said, pray in this manner, and he prayed that, that prayer that we often pray, don't we, the Lord's Prayer. I think a lot of us feel that we don't know where to begin sometimes, or we're not sure what to say, and there's a need to learn how to pray. It's not something we, we know automatically, is it? Secondly, he said that we don't pray because we don't think prayer accomplishes much. I don't think that many people would admit this this morning. And yet, many times I think we might feel that way. Deep down we might think that prayer is a nice religious thing to do because it makes us feel better. But that's about all it does, many people think. Do we really believe that prayer moves the hand of God? Can I ask that question? Do you really believe that your prayers and my prayers move the hand of God? Yes. Definitely. Do we really believe that prayer unleashes the power of God? Yes. And if we really believe that, shouldn't it cause us to pray more? It should. We should be on our knees for many minutes, many hours in our day. Well, it says in the scriptures to pray without ceasing, right? Yes. And that's an attitude of prayer. You know, if we view God as a, a, some sort of cosmic killjoy, that, then we, we want to go to Him very often in prayer. If we picture God as a colossal vending machine, as some people do, whose sole purpose is to give us what we want, then we go to Him, we put in our quarter, and out pops what we desire, or so we think. The problem is that's not the way it works. And when we don't get what we want, we become very disappointed at times and sometimes angry. And we kick the machine and, and grumble because it swallowed our prayer. The right view of God is to see him as our Heavenly Father. One who is a, a great parent who hears all of our requests. He gives us what is good for us and he withholds from us that which is not good for us. This is where the will of God comes into prayer so many times. And understanding that God is a loving, heavenly parent, that's going to have an effect on how we pray. If we approach God, our heavenly Father, knowing that he is like a parent who loves us as much as he could possibly love us, we will go to him and pray. Well, those are three points that he made. I'd like to add a couple more this morning. 
I'd like to add two more in Myers' list. I think that sometimes we don't pray as much as we should because we're all too self-reliant or too self-sufficient. I think we're overconfident in our own abilities to handle life. We tell God that we can handle all the little stuff and we only bring Him the big stuff when He wants to hear the little stuff as well. I want God's will in my life in all things, not just the biggies. So many people think they don't need God that much because life in this land in which we live is often pretty easy, isn't it? Go to the Dominican Republic or to Haiti or to some country in Africa where things are not so easy. Number five, also we sometimes don't pray because we have TB. Too busy. <laughs> I think this little poem, I, I've shared it many times over the years. It speaks loud and clear. And I want to share it with you this morning. It's called Too Busy to Pray. Maybe you've heard it before. I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish that I didn't take time to pray. Problems just tumbled about me and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me? I asked. He answered when you didn't ask. I tried to come into God's presence. I used all my keys at the lock. God gently and lovingly chided. Why, child, he said, you didn't knock. I wanted to see joy and beauty. But the day toiled on gray and bleak. I wondered why God didn't show me. He answered, but you didn't seek. I woke up early this morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to make time to pray. Mm. Make time to pray. Does that speak to you like it speaks to me? Mm. I love these words by C.S. Lewis. He said, the moment you wake up each morning, all your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists in shoving it all back in listening to that other voice and taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. Folks, if we're too busy to pray, you know what? We're too busy. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. We're too busy. Nevertheless, whatever our objections and our struggles or our hesitancies are regarding prayer, they do not change the fact that we are called to pray. And we are called to pray for one another. And Paul gave this command at the end of his letter to the Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18. He said, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Look again at our scripture for this morning in James chapter 5 verse 16. It says, therefore confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. We notice here that, that James stresses two things in that verse. First of all, he wants us to know that prayer is powerful. It's effective. It accomplishes much. I believe that with all my heart. Secondly, James wants us to know that, that we need to pray for each other. You know, God did not mean for you and I to go alone in your life. He calls for you and me to be a part of the body of Christ, doesn't he? To be a part of a fellowship of believers and share our struggles and our needs with each other so that we can pray for each other, just like we did this morning. And when we do that, God moves in marvelous ways. Amen? Amen. We see it. A man by the name of Lewis Evans Jr. once said this, certain things will not happen in another person's life unless we pray for him. Let that sink in. Certain things will not happen, will not happen in another person's life unless we pray for him. And the Apostle Paul is such a great example of this. He, he was not too proud or he was not too self-reliant to ask for prayer. And over and over again in his letters, he asked for people to pray for him. For instance, in Ephesians chapter 6, 19 to 20, he said this, Pray also for me, 
that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. To the Colossians, Paul wrote these words in Colossians 4, uh, 4 verses 2 to 4. He said, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23, Paul simply puts it this way. He says, pray for us. Just pray for us. Not only did Paul request prayer, he made it known to others that he was praying for them. Look at what he prayed for the Ephesian Christians in Ephesians 1, verses 15 to 19. He wrote these words. For this reason, ever since I've heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also, he said, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. This is what he prayed for the Philippians in Philippians 1, 3 to 6. I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Because of the partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident in this, he said, that, uh, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And one more example. Look at Paul's prayer for Philemon in Philemon chapter 1, verses 4 to 6. He said, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. With all of those scriptures I just read, let me ask you this question. What difference can our prayers make in the lives of others? First of all, our prayers can literally save a life can literally save a life. One of my favorite Bible stories about intercessory praying or praying for others is the story of the Apostle Peter. Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 12. Will you do that with me? We're going to look at a number of verses here. Acts, chapter 12. I want to start by looking at verses 1 to 5. I want to read them to you. We know this story so well. It's exciting. We learned this in Sunday school. I'm... 65 right now. You're 77. <laughs> Saturday. 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 <laughs> 65. I remember this story being told to me in Sunday school, the old fashioned flannel wrap. Anybody remember? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's a great story. Verses 1 to 5 it says, It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handed him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Just go back to the beginning there for a minute. We sometimes read over this part very quickly, because we want to get to Peter, right? But it said, he had James, Herod had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. The persecution was great. So Peter being in prison, didn't look too good for him, did it? For sure. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. You know, this is this is one of the great against all odds kind of story. 
This is the way that God likes to work, isn't it? When it's obvious that he is the one who did it because it's only something he could do. And that big, bad, old King Herod has Peter in prison and has him heavily guarded. But, but the church was earnestly praying. Underline, just why don't you underline that three-letter word in that verse? Or circle it. Or put a star beside it. But, but, that's the best but there is. <laughs> but the church was praying to God for him, for Peter. The story continues in verses 6 to 12. Follow along. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries to guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and the light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, he said, get up. The chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. So, you know, maybe, have you ever awakened some, some time at night? And you say, oh, it must be, must be time to get up. Your head's kind of spinning. You're not sure where you are sometimes. Maybe that's how Peter felt here. I don't know. But I think he thought he was seeing a vision, it says. And they passed the first and the second guards, and they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. I like these words. Then Peter came to himself. <laughs> huh? <laughs> then Peter came to himself, and he said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches. It's not a dream. And from everything that the Jewish people were anticipating for him. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Now nothing is impossible with God in prayer, is it? Amen to that? Amen. Nothing is impossible. Think about it. Soldiers, a lot of them, chains, a lot of them, locked gates. Nothing could stop God. Nothing can stop God. The final part of the story includes a little bit of humor. And I kind of chuckle when I read this part. Look at verses 13 to 19. The Bible says, Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she, she didn't open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it, and she exclaimed, Peter's at the door. <laughs> Probably as she was doing that, it was... Peter was outside, knocking on the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. They were praying for what? They were praying for Peter's deliverance. <laughs> I imagine Peter was... <laughs> but Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him, and they were astonished. Duh. <laughs> Peter motioned with his hands for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. That's a side part. But isn't it amazing that those who were praying for Peter's release didn't believe that God would save him in such a miraculous way? They were astonished, he says. So why did God include this embarrassing little tidbit in his word? I think God included it as a, an encouragement for us. So that we would understand that God answers our prayers even when our prayers and our faith are not quite perfect. Our prayers can literally save a life, whether it has to do with disease or, or persecution or foolishness 
or accidents or salvation. So let's be praying for one another. Let's do this thing that we are called upon to do. Secondly, our prayers can help protect others from temptation. In Luke chapter 22, when Jesus was observing the Last Supper with his disciples, he made this statement to Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Verses 31, 32. But I have prayed for you. There's another sentence we should underline. I have prayed for you. Simon, that you, your faith might not fail. And when you have turned back, isn't that interesting? Did you, did you see that? Yeah. I have prayed for you that your faith might may not fail. And when you have turned back, Jesus knew what was going to happen. Yes. Strengthen your brothers. How would you like to be told that Jesus is praying for you? Wow. Yes. That's something he is. He is praying for you. Simon Peter, he, he did succumb to the temptation. He denied Jesus three times. We know the story. He fell hard, didn't he? He fell far. But he turned back to Jesus. And he did not, you know, he, he did go on to lead the church to strengthen his, his brothers and sisters in the faith. And I firmly believe that, that he couldn't have done it without the prayers of Jesus Christ. Jesus was on his side that day. There are many things that you and I cannot do without Jesus praying for us. I'm glad that he's interceding on your behalf and mine. At the right hand, the hand of power of his heavenly Father in heaven. Jesus continues. Knowing that others are praying for me helps me more than I can say. You know, I, I've been in ministry 45, 46 years now. I know I look far too young for this. <laughs> But you know, there were many times, and Pastor Peter can attest, I'm sure, to this, when I was called out to uh, a stressful, difficult visitation or a counseling session with uh, someone who perhaps was in a car accident or his loved one was, was uh, badly injured in a car accident or they were struggling, <coughs> fallen in sin and they needed to be addressed and spoken to and prayed for. There were many times I ran across that in my ministry. Mm. Do you know, I had some faithful prayer warriors in my churches. Yeah. And I could get on the phone before I went to that meeting and I would, I would ask them, would you pray for me between 7 and 8 o'clock? Yeah. Between 7 and 8 o'clock, pray for me, please. I did not go into any details just to say that I'm going into a diff difficult counseling situation. Yeah. Please pray for me. And they did. And knowing that others are praying for me helped me in more than I can say. You know, when Jackie was trying so hard to be evacuated from Chad when COVID struck back in, was it 2020, Jack, at this point? Yeah. The situation looked really bleak and rather impossible. Such short notice we were given by the Canadian government that the borders would be closed soon. And not only in Canada, but across the oceans to Europe. Jackie would have to travel normally that way to come home. She was at the mission. She had a number of ailments that, uh, that concerned the staff and herself and us back here in Canada. And they suggested that she should try to get home if possible. The window was so small for her to, to be evacuated. And it looked rather impossible. There were lots of doors that seemed open at one point and then closed very quickly. And none of them seemed appropriate at the time. And many people here in Canada I know and probably in Europe were praying for Jackie. I had our churches praying for Jackie. And knowing that gave her hope. You'll have to tell them the story. Maybe you have. It's an amazing story how she got out. And the, the, the path that she had to take. And the provision that God made for her. Thirdly, our prayers can provide others what is needed for life and ministry. We've already looked at a number of verses that speak to this already. God hears and answers our prayers for help and healing, for opportunities and for courage, 
In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11, Jesus gave us this promise. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, he says, if the son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? And if you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you good gifts to those who ask him? We could name many other specific ways our prayers make a difference. But hopefully just, just these that I've mentioned this morning suffice it to motivate us to be praying for others. And as we move forward to a a conclusion for the message this morning. I want to draw our attention back to Paul's prayer request for himself. For instance, look, look again at Paul's request of the Ephesians in chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. I'll put it up on the screen. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Do you know what? I think, I think we learn as much by what Paul does not ask his readers to pray for as by what he does ask them to pray for here. Paul was a prisoner at the time. He was awaiting trial before the emperor. And given those circumstances, folks, we might expect Paul's prayer request to include maybe release from prison, the preservation of his life, or at, at minimum, Comfort or healing from the sores of his wrists and his ankles from the shackles. There would be nothing wrong with Paul asking those kinds of prayer requests, but he had something more significant in mind. And he prays it here. Paul prayed to have God's perspective about things. Paul prayed to experience God's purposes through his life. Paul was less concerned about his comforts. He was more concerned about God accomplishing his purposes. How would that change the way that we pray for ourselves and others? If we prayed less about our needs and our desires and prayed more for God's purposes. Think about that. Finally, Paul prayed to have God's power. Even though we, we have ample evidence, folks, that Paul was a very effective and gifted communicator, one of the greatest communicators in the New Testament that we read of anyway. Still, he asked his readers to pray that, that he would be given the right words every time he opened his mouth. Isn't it, isn't it strange how sometimes the wrong words come out of our mouths? <laughs> you know? When we open our mouth and we put our foot in it. Foot and mouth disease, right? <laughs> Even though we have no evidence that Paul ever lacked boldness, he regularly asked that they pray for his courage and his fearlessness. Paul's request makes it quite evident that he recognized that, that his ministry was totally and completely dependent on God's power at work through him. Well, I want to end my message this morning with two true stories. These are amazing <clears throat> stories. Just so that we might Make prayer for others a higher priority. And see just how important and effective a prayer is. A.W. Tozer, you've probably heard of him or read some of his, his uh, materials. He ministered in the city of Chicago for many years. And on, on occasion, when, when a new minister arrived in Chicago, Tozer called him and described the challenge of ministering in such a city and the great need for prayer. Tozer said this, if you ever want to pray with me, I'm at the lakeside every morning at 5.30. <laughs> <laughs> Just make your way down and we can pray together. Sometime later, I guess the new minister didn't take him up on it. <laughs> Sometime later, the new minister was going through a difficult time. And he decided to meet with Tozer for prayer. And he made his way down to the lakeside around 6 a.m., and there he found Tozer, prostrate in the sand, praying to God. Can you imagine? 
how that impacted that, that new minister. Mm -hmm. To see this man of God on his face, 6 a.m., praying to God. A.W. Tozer died in 1963, but his life continues to be a powerful force of Jesus Christ because his writings challenge people to have a, an intimate walk with God through prayer. Read some of his stuff. It's good stuff. The second story is about a woman named Dr. Helen Roseberry. She was a missionary to Zaire. On one occasion, the mother died giving birth to a premature baby at her mission station. Not unusual then, not unusual now. There was no incubator, so they tried to keep the baby alive with a defective hot water bottle. When I read that, I thought, how can a water bottle be defective? But maybe it has leaks in it. The children were asked to pray for the baby. One little girl prayed in this way. Dear God, these are her words. Dear God, please send a hot water bottle today. Tomorrow will be too late because by then the baby will be dead. And dear God, send a doll for the baby's sister so she won't feel so lonely. Now we, we struggle to find words to pray. This little girl didn't. She prayed the need. That afternoon, a large package arrived from England. England. Evelyn told me that they often would get excited about when the mission boxes would come from overseas when they were in Africa and how they would get a chance to, to go through it all. Well, that's what happened. And the children watched eagerly as the package was opened. Everyone was delighted to find a hot water bottle under some clothing. Immediately, the girl who had prayed so earnestly, she started to dig even more furiously, deeper down into the box. She said, if God sent the water bottle, then I'm sure he's also sent the doll. And she was right. Now, I want you to think just how amazing our God is here. God knew in advance of this child's sincere prayer request. And so five months earlier, Five months had to go by boat. Five months earlier, he led an English ladies group to include both of those specific items in a package that would arrive that day, five months later. That day. Is God not amazing? Amen. That's awesome to think about. We will never, ever understand everything about the way that God works through prayer. But we can know that he does. God promises that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Even if it's the prayer of a little girl. I sometimes think the prayer from a little child is profound. We can faithfully pray for one another. And we can see how God moves through our prayers. The question is, will we pray? And will we pray for one another? And will we pray boldly in a way that only God can get it done and only God can receive the glory? Prayer is ultimately not getting our will done in heaven, but getting God's will done on earth. Amen? Amen. And as we pray, I pray that we will experience God's promised peace. And we will get excited when we see God answering our prayers. Paul wrote these words. He said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Pray for one another. May we take that seriously into heart. In this church, in my home church, in churches across the land. Pray for one another. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for these amazing <coughs> verses that we read this morning about prayer. For the amazing examples that we have read about of Peter, of Paul, that young pastor of A.W. Tozer, a 
of Helen Rosevere, of that little girl who prayed for a water bottle and a doll. Father, you, you are praying for us every day. You are interceding on our behalf. I thank you for that, that I can count on you. Heavenly Father, can you count on us to pray for each other? May we make it our task. May we make it our goal. May we make it our ambition, our desire to be upholding our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ in this powerful tool that you have given us, this weapon of prayer. For I pray this in your matchless name this morning. Amen. Amen. God bless you.